Thanks everybody for joining episode seven. I do believe it is of the Authors Roundtable. It's crazy. It's uh, <laughs> it, it's been it's been good so far. I appreciate everybody joining the show. Uh, anybody listening, thank you for for listening. Uh, today's topic for the authors out there in this in this great big world of ours, it's where do you stop? Because a lot of times as, as we're writing, you know, especially me, and I, and I know Chris has, has has a problem with this right now, is you'll get to a point in your story where you either start thinking about it maybe too much because you don't want to mess it up. Or, you know, so you write things, you delete things, you rewrite it again, and it, it's just not, not working for you. Or it's technically done and you just don't want to let it go to the publisher or you don't want to hit publish if you're self-publishing. So... So that's what we're, our topic's going to be today. So I do appreciate everybody being here. Uh, we're going to do the introductions from, from the way this is on the, the, the Brady Bunch screen here for me. So I'm going to start at the top left. So Mr. John, if you could give yourself a brief introduction, that would be awesome. Hey there. So my name is John St. Clair. I live in Reston. That's in Virginia in the USA. And uh, very thankful for David for hosting these. I think I've been on all of them. Uh, to date, so I'm very happy to uh, to be a veteran of these. And if you have a moment, check out the uh, previous episodes on whatever uh, you stream uh, podcasts and videos and all those sorts of things. I am an author. Um, I write uh, all sorts of things. I do flash fiction. I do contests for microfiction. I have a novel out, which is Russian historical fiction, and I'm writing another novel at the moment, which is literary fiction. So I'm kind of all over the place. I don't have a niche. Uh, so to speak, I just kind of write uh, what what speaks to me and uh, very thankful to be here. Thank you, David. Awesome. Next, we'll go with Rami. Rami, so if you could introduce yourself, I appreciate you being on here. Glad to be here. My name is Rami Unger. I'm a novelist from Columbus, Ohio, specializing in horror and dark fantasy. My fifth book, Hannah and Other Stories, was released back in September of this year. Hannah and other stories. Here's a picture of it, which I hope I can show. <laughs> I tell God this is this is not yeah, working. Pretty bad. It's pretty bad. <laughs> oh damn that that will end so much better in my head. <laughs> so it's all so good. uh, <laughs> Hannah and other stories. It was released in September 2023. It features tales of ghosts, budding serial killers, and carnivorous horses, among other things. <laughs> it's cur available only in ebook but if it continues to do well and get it uh positive reviews the publisher is going to release a paperback version so check it out <laughs> that was awesome and next it's going to be harriet if you can introduce yourself i'd appreciate it thank you well thank you again for asking me to participate i this is my i believe it's my third but it may, might be a fourth and i've always enjoyed um talking with you all and meeting you and with other authors. It's a real pleasure. I'm Harriet Helfand. I live in Maryland in the United States and I write fiction. I write fiction that uh, has a little bit of humor. It has some legal um, aspects to it. It has twists. It has a little bit of love. Um, someone uh, described it as cozy legal fiction. So I don't know if that's a real genre, but I'll take it. Oh, it um, is now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now it is. Um, I uh, I have two books, and I will just show them. And and uh, and I see that Chris very generously has one, and he read mine, which was delightful and wonderful of him. And <laughs> so there they are. And it's um uh, there. It's a series. I didn't uh, originally intend for a series, but then I just kept going. I have I have currently two, and one on the way, which I'm currently uh, working on, and. and uh, I enjoy writing and speaking with authors. I learn something every time I do. Excellent. All right, Mr. Mr. Chris, if you could introduce yourself, I do appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much, David, for again hosting this. Uh, my name is Christopher Brown. No, not that Chris Brown. I am not a rapper. I am an author from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, I wrote a book uh, during COVID-19, during my uh, sort of medical troubles that I was going through. Uh, I am currently in the midst of writing my second book, and I am at a loggerhead right now. And instead of going to therapy like normal people, I thought it was cheaper and more efficient to just uh, come and do one of these roundtable discussions. 
discussions because after these discussions, I often get a lot more uh, juices flowing than I would do in a traditional other setting. So I'm looking forward to today's discussion. So hopefully I can get back to writing after a three month hiatus of not being able to put a coherent sentence together. So I'm looking forward to today's uh, conversation. <laughs> Good. Understood. All right, and, and a newcomer to our midst, David, if you could introduce yourself and, and, and your genre and what you do, I, I would appreciate it. Sure. Uh, my name's Dave Fuchs, and I'm not nearly as creative as you all are. I do historical nonfiction. Uh, this is my book. Latest I've done, it's uh, Sailors of Cloud Ships. It's about the age of sail. Hmm. And I am by... Uh, I'm retired now, but I was a historian and a folklorist, and I've spent my time uh, sailing almost my whole life. So I tend to go towards uh, historical nonfiction dealing with boats. And I have no problem coming up with stuff. Um, I just write and write and write. And when my wife tells me enough, I stop and then I start off. <laughs> I have like this one's done, and I've got two more books on the on the way. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I just have to get all the time to write. <laughs> the editor, and that's really, I think, uh, for me at any rate, is very necessary. And the run on and and write how I think and so forth, and that's not how people actually read. I found out so. <laughs> And editor is very, very important for me. Definitely, definitely. Well, appreciate you being on the show. Uh, Thank and you. Finally, J.A., if you can introduce yourself. And, and I, I believe this is your second or third. I can't remember. Do you? I think it's my third. Okay. Awesome. But maybe second. I can't remember. My brain is, is, is out of the building. It's 9 o'clock on a Friday. so. <laughs> Same with me. So I am um, Dea Boulay. I'm a historical fiction author, and I live in Niagara Falls, Ontario, in Canada. And I'm actually formerly from Western Canada. I, I moved here to be closer to the New York kind of hub for the, for the books and the publishing and everything, oh. and then decided that I wasn't going to tr traditionally publish anymore. Um, I wanted more control over my books. So this one here is my fifth book. And this one was nominated just recently, The Origins, uh, for the Eric Hoffer Award. So I'm I'm wow. kind of praying that something happens there. Even if I get an honorable mention, I'll be really happy. <laughs> Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. That is awesome. Well, appreciate, appreciate everybody joining. Uh, and anybody listening to the show, uh, please reach out to me if you'd like to be on a future episode. Just reach out on any of the uh, any of the internet's type social medias. I'm, I'm on most of them. So, Introduce so. yourself, David. Oh, that's a great I, thing. I, oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot. I thought I already did. <laughs> I was going across the top, right? And, and it's, yeah. But anyway, I'm, I'm Dave Muster, and, and and I'm author of The Devil's Well. Uh, so, 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 and I, I do have that. Uh, that everybody can see. I also, uh, I don't know if this will show up or not, but there you go. Rami, is that any better? That's uh, much better. That's Hannah and other stories. That's my book. Exactly. So, so, so that, that's on, that's on, on my Kindle there. And, and then, and then Mr. Brown, just to show you. So, <laughs> so I do have that as well. Uh, so I am a horror author. And, and what was interesting when I first started writing was I found out how many of my family members can't read. Uh, it's just, just a thing. And those that do, I found out how many of them said, Oh, you write horror like it's a bad thing. Yeah, I enjoy writing horror. It's you know, it's 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 one of those things where it, it's funny, Chris, because you and I are both about in the same place in books. The only difference is my book right now is really a drama, and I've got to the horror section of it where it's people got to start getting killed horribly because it's horror, and and I'm like going, I like these characters. <laughs> I don't want anything to happen to these. So so I might just have to go back and introduce some cannon fodder that gets killed along the way. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. But but again, I am your host for 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 this. So I appreciate everybody joining the Authors Roundtable. Uh, so so let's kick it off tonight with the the first topic. 
Uh, and, and we can talk as long or as short as, as people need on this. But the real big thing is, is sort of, uh, you know, from my perspective, it's where do you stop messing with your book, right? You know, you know, I'm I'm done. I I I shouldn't be be retouching it anymore. I shouldn't go back and redo that chapter. Uh, I did read the other day that Stephen King on Carrie had actually rewrote it like eight times or something like that before he finally sent it to the publisher. So I didn't feel too bad. <laughs> uh, but but for me, it's one of the things where you know, in in some instances, you know, I get to a certain place and 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 I don't know that if I, you know. I worry that I'm tired of the subject matter, right? Because I, I've been reading it and rereading it and all that, that I may make a mistake just because I'm tired of it at the time. Or is it something, you know, like like what's going on with you right now, Chris, where you get to a part and you just, the words aren't coming out of your mouth the way that you know, they are. You know, it's like, I've got something in my brain and it's not, you know, there's a disconnect somewhere. So, so, so let's, let's take those topics. Maybe Chris go first and, and give us more, you know, more information so we can properly help you with your therapy. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Crane, for bringing me in for the session today. Um, so I, there's, there's a process when you write, when you, so for me, I I've laid out a vision board. I've laid out sort of the beginning, middle and end of my story. And I've got it all into an interweb uh, of sort of where every sort of character is going to go, what everything's going to do. The issue is when I go back and I start editing, you edit things and you go, well, this could be a little bit more punchier and this could be more updated. And for me right now, I'm writing a thriller. And for the thriller aspect of it, it is more, how do I continue to keep that sort of end goal in sight without losing the sort of the integrity of the story? So when I'm going back and editing, going back and editing, going back and editing, I find that I'm changing up how things are going to sort of progress throughout the story. And I don't want to do that. And I, I kind of want to be that guy who says, okay, I've got the a, B, C, and D here. If I go A, C, B, D, it's not going to make sense anymore. So I'm wondering for anyone who else has had that moment where they've gone, I've edited it, I've edited it, and now the original idea of what my story was needs to change, but how do I change it to still keep to what I was originally envisioning? So that's where I'm stuck right now. And I'm not sure if anyone around the table has had that moment where they've been stuck at a sort of a juncture in a story where they don't know where character A is going to go or character B is going to go. Because at the end, character A and B are about to do something, but the beginning of the story that you had written and you had edited no longer tells that correct story. Yeah, see, for, for me... I haven't had that exact thing because I'm a pantser. So when it comes to the things like you said, your vision board and your plotting and all those wonderful things, I wish I could do that. I wish I could lay out a story and have it, you know, you know, here's what's going to happen beginning, middle and end. So I, I can't do that. But what I have recently is that I was writing a story and it was told from, from third person. And it was about a, you know, a fire bug, right? A guy who likes to start fires, not, not nice people, right? Well, then as I'm writing it, it collides with a story that I started about a year ago that was told from first person about a kid who sees ghosts. And, and now I'm going back and going, okay, do I tell a story in both persons, which would just, I think, confuse people? Or do I, and I'm, what I'm actually doing is I'm rewriting one of them to the other person. So, so for me, and what I'm afraid of is if I rewrite the first person one, then I lose something in that person's language because he's telling it from his experience. You know, hey, I see my parents right there. Not he saw his parents there, right? That that type of thing. So so that's where I'm at. It's sort of, you know, similar conundrum, if you will. But let's see what the others have on, 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 on you know, what do you do in, in these instances? Don't all go first. Chris needs help. Cricket, 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 cricket. I think we're still trying to figure out, um, trying to understand in, uh, Chris's problem with his story. So the exactly. problem is when you edit a story, when I've edited sort of my first, sort of first, let's say, sort of area of my story, the first six chapters, let's say. Mm -hmm. You 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 have to tell a story. You have to create a story that is, brings view, the, the the reader into what you're trying to tell. 
when I read that story over and over again, I keep on saying to myself, I can punch it up more. I can continuously punch it up. I can make it better. I can add more context. I can add more color to it. I can add more background. But the issue is when you do that, you're sort of expanding the context and you're adding into the story things that don't need to be there. And then you have to go back and edit. And then when you're editing the parts that you've already added, you're now sort of taking parts out that you need to tell the sort of second half of the story, the conclusion of the story. And that's where my problem is. I've edited it so much that the original story that I had envisioned is no longer the story that is being told on the paper. Okay, I actually have an idea for you, Chris, if this is something you wanna do. Um, one, an author that I'm friendly with and I've communicated back and forth with, um, we talked about this kind of thing and her theory is, and I'm, I've come to use this now, is just write your story. Don't edit until you've written your story. Get it all in and then, then go back and edit. And at first I wasn't doing this and I was feeling sort of stymied, just like it sounds like you are. So if you do have a feeling about where your novel is going to end up, then just write it and then go back. And I'm trying to do that now. Sometimes, it, like you said, it's so tempting to want to do it piece by piece because oh, I wrote this, but I really want to make it good. And oh, I think I can make it better. But you'll be able to do that. But then you won't have a problem with worrying about inconsistency because you will have come to the end. And then if you want to change it, you can always change it, but you won't be stuck in a place and then not be able to get to where you want to go. So that's my, that was the advice given to me. So far, it, it's been satisfying. I mean, I'm working on the first edit of a draft and I'm going through it. And sometimes I go, well, this isn't bad. And then I go, oh, this really stinks. And, you know, maybe I should add something here. Maybe I should take this out. This doesn't make sense. So that, that would be my only, um, Suggestion, and that was one that was passed to me and I have found useful. Yeah, what Harriet is saying. I mean, you're still in the, the middle of the first draft of this story, right? Uh, I have been writing this novel for about a year. That doesn't answer my question. Is it still the first draft? Uh, the first part, no, because I want to get the first part of the story perfect before I tell the second part of the story, because... In the thriller that I've set up, the context of the entire story needs to be told correctly to get to that moment of going, oh, the big reveals here, and this is what it's all about. Right now, I'm stuck at trying to get that sort of all the pieces in place so that way that next part of the story makes sense to me, because right now when I write, I'm thinking, well, I've taken this part out and I've visioned how it's going to sort of set up and it's not working out anymore. And the big reveal is going to be just a want. Well, I'm <laughs> going to give you two pieces of advice one from myself and one from my high school English teacher. The first piece of advice is, is all first drafts are crap. <laughs> they're terrible. They're shit. They're manure. They're good for the flower bed. It's, it's, uh, it is your job as the author to take that shit and grow something from it. However, to do that, you have to who first finish that first draft. You can't exactly. write it perfect on the first try, and you have to have the whole thing done before or you can really uh, start to perfect it. It's like your flat or bed it is missing like half the planks holding it together if you try. I mean, sure, you'll lay, you have some of the planks there, and you'll be able to keep those up, but then you're going to have manure going everywhere. <laughs> the second... So, first uh, piece is just finish that first draft. You can go back later and make it nice and clean and per and in good. So, what if it's shit the first time around? That's the point. Nobody else is going to read it until it's a few drafts done, and you've made some improvements and the second piece the one from my high school english teacher shout out to you mr guinan mm -hmm. uh is that no work is ever perfect it's only you can only get it to the point where it's done 
where you've done as much as you can to it, adding or subtracting will just ruin it. You've just got it done. And that's all you can do. You can't get the work perfect because nothing is perfect. Sounds Perfection like good advice is to me. Basic... Hmm? I said that sounds like good advice to me. It, there's a reason it stayed with me since high school. And, that, <laughs> and high school ended for me over 12 years ago. There you go. By the way, I'm the youngest just, in this crowd. Just about, that, just about that for me. About, about 12 years ago, I think, something like that. Uh, so, so, so who else? Oh, man, everybody's laughing. Yes. About so, 40 so, that. Three years ago, I got asked. Yeah. Uh, so, so can anybody else help help Chris with his problems? I mean, with his problem. <laughs> well, I, I do have an idea. Okay. Um, so are you an overwriter? Ooh. Like, do you I, just? I, I'm a judgmental overwriter, if that makes sense. I so overwrite, you over... right? And then I pick and then I add overwriting to the overwriting because I'm like, yeah, oh, it could be so... more colorful. <laughs> so you're so, George so R.R. You... Martin? <laughs> so, so you are an, um, an ex, a very, very good example of an overwriter. <laughs> I have one chapter right now that's 65 pages long. Oh my gosh. Oh jeez. Okay, so um I I guess there's two things. I was working with an author. I did some story editing for him. And um he was an overwriter. So for instance, like there was transition problems when he would go from one scene to the other, he would just skip right into the next scene and i said well like you no, you, you got to put some kind of transition in there um or or make a break in the story and sometimes it would be simple but then sometimes he would be like all of a sudden he's brought a new character in and the transition where it could have been um three three sentences turned into eight paragraphs with a new character. Wow. <laughs> so so I tried to get him to steer away from that and to look at your editing that you go in in a more simplistic manner where you can actually, well, you can use Word to edit things. You can um, go through it and and find a specific word and replace it with something. And there's your editing completely done for that certain issue right and the same thing can be for story editing is when you're story editing you can look at it as can i fix this in three sentences that's it but now you've now you're at the point where you have edited and edited the book so you've chopped it up and now you're story is turning out different so maybe what you can do is you can look at it look at your outline look at what you've done with your story now and see if you can make it into two books hmm. if you have two plots if you have two different ideas you can actually split it into two make a start a series there you go okay what do you think <laughs> no, and I and I agree with that. So, um, so when I say I, when I overwrite, I overwrite a lot, and I'll be the first to admit that. My issue is, I I, I, I agree with Rami's uh, point as well. I I need to get to that end of that first draft. The issue is if I can't get to the end of the first draft because I'm constantly going back and trying to make it from eight paragraphs to three sentences, do I tell the story still in those three sentences that were going to be in those eight paragraphs? At what point in time, and it gets to sort of the second crux of what the question was at the beginning that David sort of posed here, and I apologize for bogarting a lot of the time here, but it's my therapy session, so I'm taking advantage <laughs> of it. At what, point in time, <laughs> at what point in time do you have to finally say, I just have to move on, but you can't move on because now you have writer's block trying to figure out where the story has gone already. 
Cool. I'm in the process of reading Stephen King's book about writing. And while I agree with Rami, 100%, do it from start to finish and then go back and, and chop it up and edit it. Uh, Stephen King uh, said two things that might be appropriate here. Number one is to keep it simple, stupid. His saying, not mine. And the other one is... Barely know you there, guy. Call it <laughs> stupid already. This is great. And the, and the other thing is that less is more. And he was really big on going through and chopping out everything out of his books that he didn't feel um, added to the story directly. So the, he he took more of a takes more of a minimalist approach than than what you're doing. Um, just as an aside, too, I rewrote my book seven times. It's 200 pages shorter than what it originated as, and I'm a second book from that. So, yeah, you sometimes. You got to take, a, you just got to chop out a lot of stuff. I mean, yeah, you want to go back. You want to add in context. You, you want to create a whole bunch of new stuff of to will make it better. But sometimes you just got to go shorter. Uh, in my new, in Hannah, one of the stories, the autopsy kid and Dr. Sarah, that used to be close to novel length, about 40,000 words. And my publisher was like, okay, Rami, I see you've got this whole story here, but you want to know something? A lot of it is unnecessary. See if we can cut it down and just keep in the essential bits, the stuff that really makes it punchy and scary. The, and that took a lot of work. That took a lot of work. In fact, I once spent an entire weekend with at a convention when I wasn't selling books, just trying to edit the damn thing. <laughs> exactly. and it was not easy, but eventually I managed to get it down to like novelette or short novella length. And it was much better for it. It was punchier. It had, had a, a, a great beat hook. I mean, it went a lot faster. It was an improvement. And I, I haven't read what you what you're writing, Chris, because I, I haven't hacked your computer yet. But someday, but but <laughs> you know, I do like the idea that you had about the you know splitting it up into a series. I don't know if that would work for these characters, right? So could you could you somehow like like do it in three sentences, right? And then save all this other mm -hmm. stuff, sixty five pages, for being your next book, and you can say learn more about John Doe or Jane Doe or what have you in, in book two of, of this series. Right. I mean, it's, it, it's one where with me, when my first set of books, you know, I wrote them as novellas because I just really wanted to get out and get published and that sort of thing. And that's what it was. But the reality was I probably should have just put them all together. And I did eventually in a volume because it would have looked, it would have been much better to come out with the larger book first. Right. But it's just, it, I did it the way I did it. But so for me, I think if, if it's possible that you can drag it out into another one and the challenge you have is having to have a reveal because of the subject matter that you're writing, right? For horror, yeah, there's somewhat of a reveal, but it's not as much of a, oh, was it the butler? Was it this person? It's yeah, there's a monster. Somebody's going to die. Simple as that. At, at the end of the day, it's a monster. Somebody's going to die. Uh, <laughs> so the reveal might be who the monster is or something like that, but it's not, you know, it's not what you have to do for a quote unquote thriller type thing. So, so it's tougher for you. So I, I feel for you that way, but uh, yeah. Hey, uh, something that just occurred to me, Chris, um, obviously you could, and this doesn't work for everyone, probably uh, uh, the majority of people is obviously find an editor at some point, but something you could probably do that doesn't cost any money which is to find a couple of people that you trust and make them alpha readers, not beta readers, alpha readers. Maybe you're done with the story or maybe you're very close to it or maybe you're just too close to it and you just need some third party to come in um, and say what's working and what's not working. Because if you're very close to it, maybe you can't see that and they could come in and maybe they'll say, hey, this is great. Keep going. Or they'll say, listen, we're very confused. You need to go in another direction or something like that to pick, pick two people that you really trust um, and get their input. doesn't have to be anything other than 
have them read the first 50 pages or something. See if it's, if it's something that hooks a reader. You don't even have to put the reveal in. Just, just say, Hey, is this, is this something you would be interested in reading? So once um, you get through those first 50 pages, then you'll get to like halfway through chapter one, right? As long as that's okay. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't put, I wouldn't prescribe to put any limits on chapter lengths or book lengths or story lengths. The story will be as long as you need it to be. Yeah. So if the whole story is one chapter, then so be it. Don't, don't fall into some trap of following somebody else's rule if that doesn't work for you. So if people prefer to read short chapters, and that's not what you're writing, then your book isn't for them. But that just means it's for someone else. Yeah, I just want to say, when I first heard the writing term, um, murder your darlings, I thought it meant you like getting rid of your characters that you like the most. <laughs> but it, but I found out quickly that was not the case. And it can be. It was, it, well, I guess it could be too. But um, I think customarily it, it means that sometimes you have to force yourself to get rid of or to either get rid of or isolate passages that you really enjoy, that you read and you thought were really well written. And what I've done, and I'm sure other, a lot of other people and maybe every other writer does this, is keep them, copy them, put them in a separate folder. And someday either you may re-edit it and put them in, you might use it for something else. You might use it for a blog post or an extra piece that you're giving to readers at the end of your book, like here's the backstory of X or something like that. So um, even though you might love it and think it's the most beautifully written passage on earth, it may not relate to what you ultimately want to put in your story, but that doesn't mean you have to obliterate it from history and it, it may find another use somewhere. That, that's actually interesting. I had uh, a book I was just reading. I can't remember the name of it for, for the life of me, but it told the story. And then at the end, it did have a section where it was sort of extra. And, and what it did was it took things from the story. Like one of the ones was the guy went to a grocery store or something, something bad happened there. Right. Well, it told the story before he went to the grocery store, how he found out something that was bad and needed to go do something else. But it was like three or four of those different little vignettes that was at the end of the book that went back. And I thought that was a very interesting thing to do because it sort of it gave you, you know, the story after the story type things. You know, why would why did this guy have the motivation? You know, somebody was out of gas. Well, they're out of gas because the night before, you know, they 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 you know had to go out in the middle of the night to rescue a cat or something like that. I don't remember. <laughs> But it was it was very interesting to have that sort of backstory. So that was kind of interesting. So, so yeah. So nothing's wasted. Keep keep it. I, I guess. So, I, I I've taken I've listened to every single one of you, and I appreciate all your feedback. And I I think it's great that we have these sessions that we can have these constructive feedbacks. My question is, while you're writing your first draft. Because remember, I wrote an autobiography the first time, so it was a little bit different than a thriller. And this is where I think I'm getting a little bit tied up. You want to continue to progress the story. You want to continue writing. You want to continue getting to that end chapter, that thin, that whatever you want to say at the end, that first end of that first draft. But you edit during that first write. I'm assuming everyone does it. You're not just writing garbly goop and just putting words to paper and there's mm -hmm. spelling mistakes, all that jazz, left, right, and center on the script. Yes. I'm one of these people that I can't move on to something until the first part is good. And then you I move to on to the out, second. Get out of your head. Get out yeah. of your head. Seriously. Oh, if, if yeah. first part, for, don't have Grammarly on. <laughs> don't have, and not to give them a plug, but don't have Grammarly on. Don't have the spell check on for Word. Don't have at least for me, my my process. Mm -hmm. I don't have any of that because I want no distractions. In fact, one of the topics we can talk about tonight is I started reviewing a whole bunch of different editing software, and I couldn't find anything that was sort of distraction free. I want the old typewriters, almost what I want. <laughs> uh, but you know, turn all of those things off so you don't see the underlines, you don't see any of that. Just tell your story. Tell the story. You know, when I say yours, I mean your characters. Tell their story. Get it out. And then if you go back and you're rereading it, you know, through and you say, oh, wait, I forgot to introduce that person. Or like in one of mine, that was an early novella where the guy got in his truck. And then when he got to where he was going, he got out of his Mustang GT. 
oops, <laughs> and yes, that did, go, <laughs> that did go to production, but okay, I fixed it in a subsequent one, but still, you, you're going to find that hopefully in your first or second go through, you know, yourself, so don't worry about it. If you end up where you forget to introduce a character, you're going to find that during your first run through and things like that. Oh, wait, I forgot to introduce this person or their hair is red and not brown or what have you. You're going to find all of these different things. So, so my advice is just tell your story. Just get out of your head and tell your story. Yeah, I never, there's only been one time where I've actually gone back and reread all the work I've done previously. And that was because I took a break from the story yeah. he, uh, several months and I had to go back and refamiliarize myself mm -hmm. during that time. Yes, I did do some edit. It's to the uh, uh, to what I've been writing before, but that was just it was still the first draft. Um, and I wasn't like, OK, this has to be perfect. I, I was just making a quick change because I thought eh, that sounds a bit better or exactly. with the. Remember when everyone was logging on, I mentioned that I was working on a story. I was editing a story uh, involving a lot of spiders. Okay, when I first wrote that story, I knew it wasn't coming out perfect. I knew there were areas where I would have to go back, add a bunch more detail, yes. we'll make some changes here, make some changes there. I knew that was going to happen, but I was like, going to save it for the second draft. I can't go keep going back and making changes or I'm never going to be done with this first draft. I, I went back on one and, uh, you know, when I wrote it the first time, somebody's at a diner. Well, I didn't describe what they ate. I just said they ordered this and, you know, number seven, what have you. But then I said, you know, it might be more colorful to add the fact that this person's a grown man still drinking chocolate milk. It might, it might go. To, so I added things like that, just little details, right? Little details of bars and things like that. So, so again, I, I don't know if it helps you or not, Chris, but you know, write your story. <laughs> I guess, I guess it's easier said, said than done. Yes. Um, my, 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 my conflict here, and this is just me being me right now, is when you're writing something, and I know yet again, I've heard everyone that I understand you have to get to the end before you can start editing, but I don't want to get to the end and then read the first half and go, what the hell was I thinking here? Because this <laughs> is nothing. None but... of us do. Well, no, no, I disagree with that. I will actually disagree with that statement because I think there's an idea because you have a story and you want to stick to the story. So you see the flow of the story on the paper. And when you go oh, back, okay, and but, you... go ahead. But wait. Um, I love it. I love it. We're getting into the, the... nitty gritty stuff. <laughs> The, the the outline that you're talking about, right? The story, yep. right? Outlines change. You outlines are not concrete. They never are. You you you, you don't you you don't write an outline and expect your characters to completely comply. Right? You, <laughs> you 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 have to give them space. In the, like okay you're not going to start a horror book and then end up being a fantasy book yes but you're you, you got to understand your outline is not concrete it's go. more like i don't know liquid guidelines <laughs> it's a jumping off point it's a way to get your your thoughts down so that you can and actually write out the story and know where you're going and sometimes, yeah, go against the outline. I once wrote a mermaid story. He, but it he looks so the, pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I once wrote a mermaid horror story where, where uh, in the outline, I had one character surviving and another character dying. But during the course of writing, I was like, hang on. It would be a lot more fun if I switched that up. Oh, there you go. And that actually worked. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes so it's going to evolve. <laughs> that's why I don't do an outline. So, and and for me, <laughs> what what's bad is if I think of the ending of the story, I lose complete interest in writing it, and I don't finish. I've got a whole bunch of stories like that where I get to a point, and then I think, oh, this would be a great ending, and then I'm like, 
okay, I'm done. I'm out. You know, so, so I have, so when I write the last part of my story, the big reveals or whatever, that's, I learn it the same time as I'm writing it, not any time before. Yeah. So, so that, that's me. I am a true pantser. So. I have heard of that. I want, I think I read something on Blue Sky the other day where someone was like, I'm a total pantser. I cannot plot it because then I he find that I'm spoiling myself and then I hate myself and I don't lose all interest in writing the story because I've already figured out where it's going to go. <laughs> I don't want to write it because I've already read it. Right? It's, yeah, <laughs> I've already been spoiled. Exactly. But that's that's me, honestly. I can't. I can't do that. Now, now I do have, you know, certain character sheets, if you will, to go back to the old D&D days and things like that, uh, mm -hmm. that, 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 that characters don't, you know, they'll, here's the guidelines for this person, right? They're not all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're the person who drives the school bus. They're not all of a sudden going to be, oh, I also, I'm a millionaire at night. I just drive the school bus. You know, there's certain <laughs> rules for the characters. But other than those things, and I invent those as I'm writing the story and the character comes up in it, right? It's like, oh, she's she's she works as, as a waitress in, in this little diner. You know, here's her little rule set. And then I keep going, you know, with the story. But uh, no, I like the idea, though, that an outline can change because that that makes sense. And I think that blew Chris's mind there. Uh, so so that's <laughs> <laughs> you had yours written you chiseled it in stone <laughs> i have a big uh, 48 book. by 36 uh bulletin board on my wall right now <laughs> oh, i'm about no. to go rip down because of this round table discussion <laughs> <laughs> that's why you do it as a whiteboard or push pins so you can move things around that's what i mean it's on push pins i'll send you a photo of it me ripping it oh. down tonight after this oh. phone oh no <laughs> Oh, no. Send it to all of us. I want to see that. Exactly. Exactly. Anyway, no, so thank you. I I think I understand what I think I do. I think I'm going wrong. I think I I I kind of I I figured out how I can overcome this. I got. I guess I just got to get it out of my head. And to quote about four people on this call, just fucking write. Hey, there you go. I like it. I like it. Finish the damn story. Yeah, finish the damn story. That's perfect. Uh, so, so I've got another question and we'll, we'll do the personal therapy things. Uh, how do you decide if you're going to write something in first person or third person? Because as I mentioned earlier, I'm in the process of having to edit one of them to change because I don't, I don't like books that change person. Now, in one that I co-wrote with a different author, that worked because we were telling the story from third person on what's happening to them, then their reveal was told in third person about what happened to them. So that actually worked really well. But for, for this, it's not it's not that type of book, right? So so how do you decide if you do write more than one person? What's your favorite way to go, like for your genre? Well, what I can tell you is what I'm doing now. I did in, in book two and what I'm doing now. I'm not sure if it works, but we'll see. The first book was written entirely in first person from the perspective of the main character. And then there is at the end, a little bit of a coda. But when I wrote it, which was written in third person, but after, as I was writing that, I realized that I really wanted to see the story from the perspective of the other character, from another, a character. And how do I do that? So then when I started, the second volume, I wrote it all in third per. I started it all in third person. And then I felt like I lost the voice of my main character. That's what my fear is. So, so what I did, I decided to try this. I went back and I distinguished the, the chapters by the character. So the one main character remained a first person character because that was her voice. And the second character I wrote in third person omniscient. So it was written in third person. That character is never from the I viewpoint. It, exactly. However, I'm able to put that person's thoughts into it yep. written as a third person. So I've done that and alternated that with the first person. I, I was satisfied with the way it came out. Okay. So when I went to started the third book, um, I was talking to a group of authors that I communicate with, and I said, I don't want it to be boring, but I've had people inquire about another character that they felt was interesting. And <laughs> someone said to me, well, write their perspective, too. 
<laughs> so I thought, well, I, I think I'm going to end it at three because then it's going to be excessive. Although, you know, George R.R. R. Martin, you know, exactly. but um, so I've done that. Now, the third per the, the third individual, the third character is more interspersed because she's not as big a character. But since everybody liked her, I felt like I had to keep her in. But that's how I've done it. Um, and I've, I've felt good about it. I felt like I've been able to develop each character with their separate personality that way and do it in a way that distinguishes them so that um, hopefully to avoid confusing which character is doing what. Exactly. So that's my. Yeah, that, that's my fear is the confusion. So anybody else have ideas on that or anybody else need therapy for something? <laughs> I just found out I have to throw out my entire book. So, you oh, know, <laughs> Joke, joking. And I think somebody called you stupid. No, Simon, you said no. keep it simple, Simon. No. Uh, so, so what What else do we got? What are, what are, what are problems? Can I, ask, can I ask you a question, David? Sure. Uh, what you said about not knowing how you were going to end your book interests me. How do you start it? Do you have a basic story in mind? It, honestly, I, I I am one of those writers who write things as they come to me in my head. So for my for my first book, Keeping the Light, my daughter was getting ready, you know, to to be going to college in a couple of years, right? So so I said I I started off saying I want to write a story about a young girl going off to college and dealing with family, right? And so I just started writing it, and the next thing I knew, there were these shadow creatures that were pursuing her. There, there were crazy things, and, and at the end of it, it's it's a story about family because they they come, you know, she she comes back home and the family helps try to save her and all that good fun stuff. So, because it is horror, but for me, I start with an idea uh, for the Devil's Well. I'm a huge fan of um, of H.P. Lovecraft and a huge fan of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and I was like, you know, what if those two things sort of come together? And and so so I write sort of a, a coming of age story about a young man going off on a mountain hike, trying to you know trying to prove to himself as much as anything else that he can do it. So I started off with that idea, and then at the end of the day, it turned into the to the story it did. So yeah, so I, I really just write as things are coming to me. So I I don't know if there's voices in my head, uh, but it sometimes feels like they're dancing in there. So that's <laughs> great. But that's me. I, I can't I can't think of things ahead of time. I mean, every now and then I'll think of a scene ahead of time. And and especially my last book was uh it's it's not out yet, but it's a serial killer novel. And and I got hosed in the drive-thru and you know myself. So basically I order with ketchup only, no cheese. Sorry, I'm one of those weirdos. So the person put you're cheese. among good weirdos. Believe exactly. me. So the person put cheese on my hamburger, and I didn't notice it until I'm driving down the road, take a bite, going ah, yeah. And then I thought, wait a second, I'm in the middle of a serial killer novel. I wonder what that person would do if somebody in a drive thru <laughs> messed up their order. So, so needless to say, uh, spoiler alert, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> The, the young man ends up with hot cheese poured all over his head and he's no longer with us so but that that, that was a that was a fun story to write uh the thing about that one i did actually use an alpha reader for the first time on that one because i needed to know that the story worked i wanted you to like that serial killer at the very beginning not like dexter but i wanted you to like him because you understood why they were doing it you wanted them to kill the people that they were killing that's perfect. We love him. We love this guy. He just, you know, need those people needed killing, as my mom would say. And and but then he sort of starts killing other people. And you're like, well, wait a second, you know, the draft the guy, he's making three dollars an hour. He's not, he's, he doesn't really deserve that. And but then I explain it on why he's doing the other people. So you're back to liking him again. Well, then at the end, it's you know, whether you're liking him or not. I, I'll, I'll leave that up up, up to y'all when you read it. But it was one where it was a fun roller coaster. So it wasn't like yours, John, where there's a reveal. But I wanted to make sure that that roller coaster ride of the story worked. Because if the first person read it and just said, yeah, I hated this guy all the way through it, then that didn't suck them into the story of saying, hey, this person's okay. family was killed by this. This is why they're, why they're doing what they're doing. I understand it to this person's just evil. And I didn't want that at the very beginning. So 
So that's why I did that. So yeah, everything for mine just starts with an idea. Hmm. All Very right. So next you. question or topic for people, what do we got? So Mr. St. Clair, what are you working on now? What are your problems? Uh, I don't have any problems per se. I, I do a lot of, uh, I've been doing a lot of these micro fiction. Yeah, um, it must be nice not to have problems. <laughs> uh, contests. They they keep adding um, them. They, they have different uh, word lengths. And so the, the, the organization that's been doing these for a while has a flagship one every year. All of these contests are once a year, but they have multiple contests at multiple levels. So they their flagship is in January and it's their short story. It's 2,500 words. And there's a lot of money uh, to, to, to be won. It's pretty prestigious. They've been doing that for about 20 years, but they keep adding these different ones. There's a, there's a thousand word one, which is in two parts. There's a 500 word one now, which is brand new. There's a 250, which is actually next weekend. Um, there's a hundred word one. And then there's some, uh, there's different formats. There's a screenwriting one in two different formats. And I think there's a, uh, I think I'm leaving something out. Poetry. Poetry. Yeah. Oh, and then there's a rhyming one. So they have all <laughs> these different ones and I've been doing those uh, when I'm not working on my main uh, goal, which is another novel. Uh, and I think that's uh, good to, to write different things. The neat thing about these contests is you cannot pick, uh, you don't pick your genre or your keywords or your, or your, uh, uh, plot or anything they're all assigned to you randomly so for some and harriet knows this uh harriet's been in a couple of these uh, i've gotten uh, there's 15 different genres i've gotten romantic comedy a bunch of times which is not something that i read and is not something that i uh thought i would be good at but if you get it four or five times then you start getting good i suppose but it kind of takes you out of your comes now it, it yeah, it takes you out of your comfort zone because you are forced to uh, to to write in genres that you're not uh, either reading all the time or familiar with or possibly even like, and uh, they're all at random. And so, um, while I might prefer to get historical fiction or science fiction or something, um, I've only ever gotten science fiction once, and I got I've never had historical fiction, but I've gotten romance and rom coms a whole bunch of times. I've only gotten horror one time. So what's the name um, of the organization? The name of the organization is NYC, like New York City Midnight, like the middle of the night. And if you just do that, uh, those two keywords and you put in like uh, stories or short stories or, or contests or microfiction, you'll go straight to their page and they are totally legit. They for each one of these contests, they get several thousand people. So the the uh, the uh, short story one might have six thousand uh, contestants and then they'll do different rounds and each round uh, the number of people that progress uh, is greatly reduced and so they'll take the top 20 percent in the first uh, round and then they'll take the top 20 percent of those people and then there'll be a final round uh, and, and so on and it's it's pretty prestigious I know for a fact that uh, that there are some professionals that that are in this contest and they're using pseudonyms because some of the folks writing is just so beyond anything that I could put out. It's just obvious that these people are on another level, which is fine. It's uh it's a good, good competition. Uh, I think um, it, it, it's, it's kind of neat, but when I'm not working on my main project, we've always got one of those coming around since they have seven or eight or nine of these. Now there's, there's one about one every month now. So it, it, it's kind of cool. I did it. I did it once. I liked how they provide you feedback. They do give you feedback. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm not even talking it up. They they give you three different judges that will give you written feedback at every level that you participate in. So even if you don't make it to the second round of something, you'll get feedback. You'll get feedback on every level. In addition to that, they have a pretty robust uh, user writer forum type thing. It's sort of like an old bulletin board where you can go and post your stories and have other contestants. Within your own uh, groups, everybody's divided into groups with the same genre and keyword and things, uh, could read your stories and give you feedback. And that's it's optional, so you don't have to post in there. But if you do, you'll get feedback from the people that were in your same group, or you're free to read anyone else's story uh, who posts in there. And like I said, there are several thousand people in this group, uh, this organization, and so you're always going to get uh, somebody. But the written feedback uh, is, is quite illuminating. Nice. And yeah, for those John's who want to enter, it's opened in 49 days. Say again. 
it's opened in 49 days the f- first intake for 2024 yeah that's uh that's their flagship the one that they do it's either at the end of january or beginning of february they have a big one i think it's the end of january their short story one and there's that's also the a time story. component yeah there's a time component most of the ones you only get 24 or 48 hours so this is this mm-hmm. is flash fiction or micro fiction yeah. the short story one because it's 2500 words in the first round you get eight days but then that drops to four days in the second round and two days in the third round so there's a time component too so it's totally randomized genres totally randomized uh keywords and plot points and things like that and uh it, it, you you never know what you're gonna get so it's it's, it's pretty cool I like that. All right, another question for everybody. So, so, so here's the here's the other thing for me. So, so Dave's on the couch a lot today. Sorry, 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 Chris. I know you didn't want to be on the couch next, but uh, no. The the big thing for me is descriptions and detail. So there's sometimes where I'll find myself going down a rabbit hole of detail. Uh, not as bad as uh, the uh, is it Ludlum that wrote the Hunt for Red October, where the the sh- the, the Tom round, Clancy. Clancy, yeah, 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 Tom Clancy. The round went around and around and around through, the, and it's like it just kept describing, you know, like like something as simple as Dave reached for his cup. There was <laughs> condensation on the cup, and, and all the the entire scene was really just the guy taking a drink out of his cup. But you know, let's make it three pages. So I don't want I don't want to get to that point because. But don't get me wrong, I like I like I like some of his books. And uh, but how do you decide where to limit some of the descriptions to? Right, myself, I'm trying to limit it to what makes sense. Like I said, the guy ordering you know chocolate milk, grown man drinking chocolate milk at a diner, you know, eating pancakes with with lots of syrup, stuff like that, because that's sort of added to that character's description plus makes me hungry just thinking about it now but (laughs) but i you know i don't need to describe everybody's plate in the diner so how do you decide what needs a more in-depth description and what doesn't is it something as simple as what moves the story forward or is it hey this might be interesting to people to know x what i can i can weigh in on that and that kind of dovetails to your previous question which is about point of view um, I prefer to write stories in the first person point of view, just what I prefer. Some people may do third, some people may do first uh, and third. Um, that's just what I do. So to answer your question, in the first person point of view, the protagonist is only going to be able to be aware of what they can see, experience, what what their knowledge is. You're not going to get this uh, omniscient point of view. So there, there's going to be information that's not known to the narrator that can't then be passed on to the to the reader um if the protagonist the first person point of view person doesn't see or or doesn't hear something you're not going to see or hear that it really limits your uh awareness but it also concentrates uh what uh what needs to be said um so if a person is sitting in a diner to use your example they're not going to suddenly start thinking about what this other person is eating or thinking about most likely unless they have a reason to they're going to concentrate on what is right in front of them or who they're speaking with or what they're uh, doing in that diner so it's automatically going to shunt you into a restricted uh, space which really uh, cuts out a lot of uh, uh, places where you might fall into a trap of just going off and and describing the entire diner and everything that's going on in there there's no reason to do that, that the person that, that is in your, uh, that, that the reader is reading about uh, wouldn't like that and that wouldn't read well either. Exactly. So uh, if you tell a story in first person, you're really going to be restricted into what you can tell the reader, uh, in, in my opinion. I I actually think it depends on the genre. Okay. Um, now, historical fiction yeah, you would be describing the events, the wars, whatever's happening. But I find in fantasy, that world building needs that, right? Mm. It needs all of that extra, you know, there was purple, um, there was purple, whatever made up butterflies. And there was uh, there was an, a blue sunrise, right? 
Um, and it needs that extra details. Okay. But if you're writing in romance, you don't you don't need that, right? Okay. I like that. Yeah, and that, that makes sense. I mean, it's you know, I, I do like the world building thing. I've been staying away from that. Uh, for all of my stuff so far, because it's I'm I'm still on the keep it simple principle, just to keep reusing that one. Uh, and because the thing of it is, with with horror, it's too easy for something to be a world crisis, right? It's oh, this is this, and it's the whole world, and then it's that's a bigger story than these five characters who are in a cabin in the woods, right? It's it's and and I I, I don't know that I'm ready as an author to go to that, so that's why I still keep it simple. But I do like. I do like the idea about, you know, like I said, if it is some type of world building or some type of, you know, romance or something like that, you're going to be describing other things than 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 the sunrise or the diner or what have you. So, but like I mean, you said, the cheeseburger, right? The cheeseburger <laughs> turned out to be something really cool. Right? Exactly. <laughs> well, not, not for the boy working at the drive-thru. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when I, as a reader, like I guess you could ask yourself as a reader, are you going to be interested in reading that? And so for me, I would be. I, I would be like, that's really cool. And I'd have a chuckle about the cheeseburger. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Hey, can I ask a, a stupid question, but an important question to the pe two people who've written historical fictions in the group here for a second? Sure. Yeah, I've no written the historical fiction. <laughs> well, I three, counted? three of you then. Three of there you. you. Yeah, painting, a, painting a picture of a vibrant world. So uh, my thriller currently takes place in not in Canada, but in the 1800s. So there is uh, an understanding and you can do research as much as you want, but unless you are there, unless you're in that historical time period yourself, you kind of have to take some liberties. So at what point in time, when you're painting the picture of what the atmosphere is like at that time, do you have to sort of escape from the fiction part and go, okay, I, I have to kind of make some things up here because I wasn't there. I don't know the smell. I don't know the taste. Because when you're trying to describe a smell of a certain atmosphere in that time or describe how things were, you can go by pictures. You can go by what uh, books are told. But unless you're there, you can't properly write about it. So for the, for the people who have written sort of historical fictions and have been in that time zone, how do you make sure that you're telling a story authentically but not too unauthentically, if that makes sense? I think I see what you're saying, uh, Chris. I think the easiest way is, um, obviously, if you're doing a bunch of research and you do want to be as authentic as possible. So if you are uh, describing something that is very easily uh, learned or known or could be looked up, uh, don't go against that. But if it's something that's really mundane or there's no uh, written account, then use your imagination. And, and you can do both. Um, you don't want to contradict unless it's a fantasy. Uh, there's a, such a thing as historical fantasy where you would take events, but then change obvious outcomes or obvious uh, things that happened, but, but keep it uh, historical. If it's truly historical fiction, keep it as authentic as you can. But if it's something that can't be disproved, then feel free to, to use your imagination. Okay. If, if that makes sense. It does. It's just uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to paint a picture in my mind and on it through the words, of, uh, of of a setting. And when I'm writing it, I'm saying, okay, it, people know of this place. People, it's an actual place. Things happened in this place, so it's yeah. in a time period where things were going on. But when I'm writing it, I'm going, okay, is this a believable? moment in this time space does that make sense because i'm trying to make sure that it's as authentic as possible but right. add some layers to it where people can go i can see this happening in this time period or in this area but it's not exactly what i would envision what would be happening at this time i see what you're saying i think it can certainly be believable if it doesn't contradict known yeah facts. okay um but and this is uh this, I see a lot of people doing this in the historical fiction 
base. They'll have characters that everybody that, that are world famous that everybody knows, and you're not going to contradict them. But you'll invent characters that obviously didn't exist to interact with them, and that's totally fine too. No one's going to disprove you because you invented that character that's in that's interacting with a known character, unless you do something that's contradicting history, and that's all, and that's fine too. But then it's not fiction anymore; it's fantasy. So, if that or makes alternative sense. history, or alternative history, yeah, yes, alternative yeah. history, yeah, that alternative yeah. facts. Sure, uh, well, Mr. Lincoln have my seat. So, see, I was a character who gave Mr. Lincoln my seat. See? Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, Actually, I, I I did that in um in my third book, The Wars Between Us. There was wow. a um there was a factual account of. Of the captain of one of the ships in the um, Battle of the Atlantic, where he had sunk with the ship. Okay. And there was a, an actual fact, factical account of right before he sank, he had a life jacket. And he was the last one to jump off the ship. And of course, this ship, these ships back then were filled with 17-year-olds, right? That's... Yeah. Yeah, they were all like teenage boys almost, right? They're, and even this captain was only 28. And that back then, that was, you know, quite senior. Mm -hmm. And there was a factical account of him taking the life jacket off and giving it to one of his, uh, his, his sailors. And that's how he died. So... I wove that into my story and he gave that life jacket to one of my fictional oh, characters perfect. because nobody really knew, right? Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. What yeah, who perfect. he gave that to. Sure. Right. And it it wove so nicely in there. And at the end of all my books, I put in um a final note to reader, which separates fact from fiction. Cause I find as a reader, when I'm reading historical fiction, I immediately just believe everything <laughs> <laughs> and and i like it separated out because then i can go back and go wow that actually did happen right with that captain mm -hmm. right and it makes the book more um well interesting and it makes you really want to delve into that piece of history <laughs> no that's awesome i like that yeah that's uh thank you wait. yeah it, it, it's one of those things that, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, people hear about, but then you, you come to find out that that wasn't really the case. So that's the only thing I can give you, you know, a little bit of advice on Chris is make sure that you're for the things you want to present as fact, you know, do the research, because what you don't want is you don't want the first day it's out there, all <laughs> social media going well, no, this guy was never in Canada. How could how could that be, right? You know, so so just make sure you know that there there are no mooses in Canada. No, you know what I'm saying. But but just just <laughs> just, just, just make make sure you uh, you cover it with uh, with with what makes sense. Not you know he he picked up his cell phone and and dialed right. It's it's the telegraph or did they have the telegraph? <laughs> right? Did the people have electricity? Or were they using kerosene lamps? You know, because you have to remember, I mean, my mom, she was born in 1932 in uh, Virginia. And they still had, when she was a young kid, they still had the kerosene lamps and things like that. Mm. So it wasn't just you turning on the electric, the electricity. It was you're lighting that kerosene lamp. And yes, you are going to the old out, outhouse out back. It's, you know, so indoor plumbing and stuff like that. I know that's probably not key to your story. But it may be something that is a nice, interesting fact to throw in there that, you know, hey, this guy was killed, you know, when walking back from the the, the outhouse or what, whatever they're called there, that, that type of thing. But but uh, that, that's the only thing is make sure that unless you're presenting it as an alternate history, that 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 you try to stick to as real as possible. Right. And this is where I need to write like five books to finish this one book now then. <laughs> It's a series. You've already got a. You've already got the first book just on the first chapter, which is not. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. It's it's all good. It's all good. All right. So so who who else has any questions or who else needs hopped up on the couch? Anybody? All right. Tell me about your mother. <laughs> I'm sorry. We've been talking therapy. I just wanted to do. 
do a, a Sigmund Freud impression. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one thing. Okay. Um, since, well, the, I, I'm actually currently writing my sixth book now. Congratulations. And I love writing. It's, it's what I was, I believe I was meant to do, mm -hmm. right? And so... Mm -hmm there is a great passion in it but now it's becoming a job <laughs> and that's a good thing because i'm becoming a much better writer i'm more structured i write on certain days and i have um you, you know how when you first get a job you're kind of the 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 green person right and then when you've been doing it for so many years you have a system right and you go through and and you're you're good at your system but it feels like a job now and how can i get that feeling back of writing my first book the first book was awesome when you write a first book you're you're thrilled yeah. right? So how do you get that feeling back into, into your job so it can reflect into your writing? Like I, I my writing is technically better. Um, but I think I'm starting to lose some of the emotion and passion that I had. You're getting early. burned out. No, I don't think I'm getting burned out. I'm just but it's it job. sounds like it sounds like the early stages of burnout. At any rate, they say make your if you have fun on the job, then you'll never work a day in your life. But it sounds like it's becoming a lot more like work for you. So, I would say take a break, indulge in some self care. I mean, I took a mental health day from my work, and I already feel well, a lot better. And uh, just take some time for yourself. Go out and uh, see a movie or stay in and just binge watch something you've been meaning to binge watch. Read some books, uh, drink some hot cocoa, whatever makes you you'll feel better. And when you get it back to it, you might find some of that creativity has been welling up inside you. That emotion, maybe something you read or watched has really got you inspired to work. Um... Other than that, the only thing I can think of is get yourself a day job that um, really makes you want to uh, write just so you can get out of that day job eventually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do I do have two careers, so I, I have a very full um, life. But that's funny because that's what my kids said. They my kids went what my kids my they're 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 in their twenties and early or late late teens. Um, they said, "Mom, just get a hobby." <laughs> and, and wasn't said, that, that? what it, exactly? It's like writing started out as a hobby for me, and it's like, okay, now I'm doing this and and yeah, and social media things. I'm like going. I didn't post anything. I didn't encourage other yeah. writers today. I'm a bad person. I didn't do. Yeah. I'm like, wait a second. That's not my job. I'm like, you know, so, so, so for me, the only thing I was thinking about when you mentioned it is maybe jump to a different genre for a little bit, just for fun. Even if it's only a short story, if you've never wrote like a, a, a really hardcore horror book, write something like that. If you've never, you know, if you've never written, you know, something, you know, a Western even or something like that or, or, or what have you. you know, write, Actually, write. that's what I'm trying right now. No, I am trying, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a little bit of Western into it and that's it awesome. is fun. I'm, mm. I'm really quite enjoying it. It's a, it's an, a, my first American history too. So it's, nice. uh, it's, it's technically more difficult for me. And um, yeah, so it, it is fun, but yeah, I, I, I couldn't imagine even writing a fantasy book like I that would just blow my mind. I <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to start. <laughs> you, you know, it, it, it occurred to me uh, about what John was saying about these contests. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a diversion. You know, you just need a brief diversion from what you've been doing. And sometimes they don't take very, I mean, you don't, you, you don't even get much time to do it, but it's just yeah. um, a tactic to get your mind focused on something else 
for a brief period of time mm -hmm. to uh, maybe recharge your your passion. Yeah, and that, that's what I was I was thinking when he was talking about that. I was thinking maybe I should try something like that, <laughs> but I can't do it while I'm writing a book. Yes. Mm. Because I, I when I'm writing in. Yeah, when I'm writing a book, yeah, I'm locked in. I got laser focus. I, yeah, I have to finish that first draft. I have to finish the second draft, the third draft. It's got to be done. Oh, okay. <laughs> maybe you could try, uh, maybe you could try something new, but that feels kind of like writing or reminds you of writing. For example, I uh, make wine as a hobby, homemade wine, and I find that it's a lot like writing. I mean, it requires patience, bringing the right ingredients together, multiple uh, ch multiple treatments, if you will, uh, like <laughs> adding, adding the right amount of sugar or going through more or fermentation feels a lot like the editing process. <laughs> oh, and the first draft... <laughs> The first, uh, after primary fermentation, it's going to be alcoholic, but it's going to taste really bad. And, <laughs> and that's kind of like a first draft right there. there we <laughs> <go>. <laughs> I like it. I like it. You know, but that, that's the advice I have. It's just, you know, try something different, different genre. The the Western genre right now, I mean, with Yellowstone and stuff like that, even, even a modern story told in Montana or something like that, it is interesting uh as far as jumping to fantasy or something like that it's not you know i've got things in my head for them uh but for me it's one where everything just sort of has a horror tinge to it so i, I don't know that i won't try to jump into the fantasy realm someday but just have it be horror because well, why not that, that, yes. that, that, that's sort of where, where i hear that horror in, my, in all of my social media names i'd hate to do something else uh <laughs> yeah that that for me it you know, sometimes it does feel like jo a job and it, it, it's like, you know, okay, it's not nine, nine o'clock at night. If I'm not writing on my book, something's wrong. And, 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 and it makes me mad. You know, I feel bad the next day because I didn't write, but then it's like, wait a second, this is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be my <laughs> hobby. It's supposed yeah. to be, you know, it's, it's like, you know, but, but yeah, so that, that's the only advice I've got is try, try other genres, try, Try those short fan things, but I understand exactly what you mean on getting focused on, you know, mm -hmm. your book that you're currently writing on because you don't want to take a chance of losing that trail. That flow, yeah, that flow, yeah. My western is actually the second book in this series. This one I'm writing right now is like the Western Frontier, I guess, the very beginning oh, of nice. it in 1810. Mm -hmm. But the second one is about the. Uh, the, the civil war right yeah. so it's it's way more western and yeah. and i'm kind of like well i gotta get through this book and get it all finished yeah. so i could do the western <laughs> <laughs> i want cowboys <laughs> just remember cowboys did and go around having gunfights and defending small towns all the time most of the time they just has actually herded cows up and down <laughs> on the country yeah <laughs> most yeah. of most of our popular image of cowboys, I learned this a few years ago, is total bullshit. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I do. I do like the the. There used to be these old commercials where you would hear these things where it's like you know, get these these stories of these old Western people and old Western criminals, and one of them was John Wesley Hardin. Who once killed a man for snoring? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm like, can you imagine if you were known for that? You know, Dave Muster once killed a man for snoring. <laughs> but no, I, I like it. Okay, my, my battery's going to go. So I'm going to have to leave and say bye. But thank you well, again, well, David. This has been wonderful. Show, Thanks show, to everybody. I've please, learned so much. Please show your book, Harriet, oh, again. Yeah. If you can, please show oh, your thank book. you. Yeah, sorry to break it up, but no, no, uh, don't, don't be at all. Like I said, we're, we're, we have yeah, oh, book thing, so we can do the covers. So if you got your books, okay, book uh -huh. one, we'll, we'll do that. John, you got one of yours? Book yeah, two. I got it right here. There you go. David, oh, there you there have my yeah. book. There you go. Okay, hang on, hang on. Let me get, uh, let me get this Do here. a picture or something, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll hold yeah. a picture up of his book as soon as it warms I up. I can screenshot it. You don't need to take a photo. There we go. We'll do that. Thank you, because it's Thank only you. available in ebook right there now. Oh, right. Harriet, oh, quickly that. jump Hold up. Yours up, Harriet, so we get the cover for the photo. Awesome. There we oh. go. Oh, oh, hold oh, on, hold on. Yeah. There, there you go. go. Jeez. They're backwards. Right. Hey. 
<laughs> Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Thank Thank you. Invert Thanks, it. Thanks yeah. to everybody for being on. Like I said, I'm you know I'm happy to go for longer if we can. If 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 not, we can sign off. Uh, appreciate it, but thank you, Harriet, for joining. Now. Yeah, Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So everybody else, do y'all have time to keep going for a little bit, or, or we, we need to sign off? It's going dead too. Okay. Okay. You're going to. It's good to see you, sir. Take care. Yeah. You too. <laughs> Great. Y'all thank have you. Thank you for being on. Yep. All right. And then there was five, right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. I had to count. You, you were froze for a second, Chris, but you're back now. I, don't know if I think he's still thing. frozen. Is he still frozen? I think he. Oh, he's you could have had it. You could have had it. Awesome. Awesome. I, I guess right, I so need to continuously to move so that way you understand that I'm not frozen. Is that the Mr. Roboto? Samo <laughs> arigato, Mr. Roboto. <laughs> I, I, I want to pick up on what, uh, sorry, I, I, all I know is J.A. Is, what's your first name? I apologize. I, I just go by J.A. Okay, perfect. That's what yeah. I thought. I just wanted to make sure before I address. <laughs> so when you were talking about that sort of the context of sort of you needing to write, it's becoming more of a job than a hobby and a uh, passion. I, I found that in my other job and that's my other life uh, I found that I was getting into that position as well I was doing something that I was enjoying and I was doing it for fun and I was excited about doing and then it be started becoming sort of a chore and it started becoming <laughs> somewhat of a ongoing issue where it's like okay I need to keep up with things because if I don't then I'm going to sort of let let myself down uh, that I had to sort of take myself out of that context because if I kept on pushing myself, I was going to burn myself out and I would never want to do it again. So in my instance, and this is just me being me here as the fellow Canadian in the group, I, I'm talking to a fellow Canadian. Um, I, I would just say, just look at it more as a, um, more of a moment where, you just got to love what you do. And some days it's going to feel like a chore and some days it's not. And some days it's going to feel like it's pulling teeth and some days it's not. This sh too shall pass. There was a clip on social media of Tom Hanks saying something about an author's round uh, or actor's round table saying this too shall pass. It's negative now, but this too shall pass. It's good <laughs> right now, but this too shall pass. So this too shall pass and it will feel good one day. See you, Rami. <laughs> Yeah, he did. He didn't want to interrupt, but no, I, I I like that advice too because that's one that, you know, again, even even for me, it's something that, you know, I get so hard on myself because I didn't write and I didn't get you know because mm -hmm. when I was writing my first book and I'm sure it was you know this way for for you as well, Jay, or maybe it was you know the first couple times you're writing, you're getting twenty five hundred, three thousand words a oh, session yeah. or more, and it's like yeah. oh, this is great. It's like it's yeah, like 3 a.m. Like, I don't want to stop. This is awesome. That, and, that's and, what and, I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. It's like it's like it's like the honeymoon period of when you have a relationship, right? Yeah. Well, I've lost that. <laughs> but I but I have it. to say, I have to say, I I think I just procrastinate more because and, and I get mad at myself if something comes up and I can't write on the day that I was supposed to write. Yes. But that's fine. I usually just juggle my other career and I, I fit it in into another day. But once I finally sit down, right, I immediately get immersed. It's like I'm in this vortex and I'm gone. I'm gone for sometimes four hours. I don't even get up. Exactly. Right. And and then once I'm like done for the day. I am deliriously happy. I love it. I'm just like, oh my God, this happened. And and this happened. And I want to tell everybody about the scene that I wrote, right? Yep. But, you know, they usually I'll tell my kids about it, but <laughs> you can't really go blabbing about all the scenes. <laughs> but Spoiler. yeah, I do. I do feel that immense happiness after I get over the procrastinating, right? 
Like, why is that there? Every author seems to have that. Why? We love what we do. Why do we procrastinate? <laughs> it's killing me right now because I'll sit down to write. And then, as I said, I'm complaining about Microsoft Word. You know, sorry, Microsoft. Sorry, Bill. But it's got all these distractions. And so I'm going, okay, instead of me writing, I'm going to look for other editors that I can use, right? And open office and all the Hemingway and all these other things. And I'm like going, okay, Dave, I just spent three hours downloading all these different <laughs> editors, trying everything out, when in reality, I could have been writing. I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? So, mm. Or you could have just turned off the spell check and grammar check on Microsoft Office. So it doesn't exactly. Distract you. exactly. Take, take your own advice, right? Isn't that the way it goes? But, but yeah, no, that's... Uh, but the only other thing I can think of for you is if you do have any alpha readers or somebody like that that you really trust that you could send them, you know, that really love your stories. Like I've I've got a, a friend of mine, Kim Huffman, so shout out to you. Uh, she's one of the people that my brother, after I published my first, you know, couple of novels, he goes, uh, Kim wants to give you a call. Is that okay? And this has been a family friend forever. And I'm like, sure, give, give me a call. I, I, I didn't know what it was about. And then she goes, okay. She goes, in this chapter here, when this guy did this, was it really doing this? Is he related to this person? And all of the, she was thinking about the, all of these things about the story. And I'm going, okay, I didn't think of it in that much detail when I was writing it. But it was <laughs> awesome that she's doing that. So yeah. for me, you know, I sent her a copy of the story. I said, I, you know, I said, this may change and all this kind of stuff. But what do you think? Do you like this? And so if you have somebody that's that into your stories and things like that, you know, start sending them chapters and say, hey, what do you think of this? Or what do you mm -hmm. think of the scene? Right. And 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 just because what you're going to get back from them is not going to be criticism. So I'm not saying send it to people who may you know, maybe give you real feedback, uh, but, but send it to people who are going to give you positive feedback. Right. You know, this is great. I like this. I like that. You know, they might not give you the negative stuff, you know, because you don't want that. You want somebody positive influences for this this task. But but you want, you know, you would get that instant feedback. Uh, it may even be something where you want to consider that whole Amazon thing where it's the published chapter at a time for a story. That might be a fun, fun thing to try for you. Uh, I forget the what? what? Amazon's got something where you're publishing chapters at a time of a story. And it's also meant for social media things where people oh. get, they get the first chapter for like free or first and second chapter for free. And then the idea is, is that the author is continuing that story and then people pay for the subsequent chapters that they're, that they're writing. I think it's Kindle Vela is, is what it is. Uh, but it, it would be something that the, the nice part about that is the, the, the premise to it is that you're getting that instant feedback from your readers on this type of serialized story. So in my opinion, if you're writing a serialized story, you have to have you know, almost a beginning, middle, and end in each chapter so that people mm. feel that they've got something, but they're still reading the, they still want to read the next about this character. Mm -hmm. So you got to keep it engaging that way. Uh, but, you know, maybe doing something like that would be be something fun. Uh, I've wanted to publish on that, but I haven't found the right story for it yet. So I, I, I know nothing about it other than the first two chapters are free and any others after that, uh, the whole thing that Amazon's trying to capitalize on, not that Amazon would capitalize on anything, uh, but the whole thing they're trying to capitalize on is you've got people who read 15 minutes at a time, right? Yes. I've got 15 minutes. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I'm yes. a 10 minute reader. I'm, I'm reading yeah. in, in the cafe, you know, give mm -hmm. me something that can excite me for the next 10 minutes. And then if I like it, yes, I'll come back and tune in for the next, next week's episode, whatever it is. So, but that might be something to get. That's, feedback. that's sort of like Pat. Patreon. Am I saying that right? Pa Patreon? Yes, that, that's so. sort of like what they do, right? Exactly. I just, yeah. I just find that that's just, it's too much extra work for me. Right? <laughs> Believe me. I, I can't, I can't fit it in, but, um, but I think I'm actually going to take up the advice of, of one of you. I can't remember who said it, but I think I'm actually going to start playing piano more. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I like it. And and just get some of that creative energy just going in a little bit of a different direction, right? Exactly. No, I like that. That's yeah. 
focusing on something for me going to the gym sometimes helps right because I'll, I'll i'll go to the gym straight for six months never miss a day and then i'll start writing again and then i'll miss the gym because i'm busy writing and then i'm like gee i wonder why the creativity you know went away and and and, and my tiny little you know lizard brain doesn't say gee dave doing something else gives you creative <laughs> energy for what you like to do so so yeah that that might help you as well mm-hmm I mean, the, the thing with me is I don't see how, like, like John, with you, with your, with your book, with your novel, mm -hmm. I don't see how you kept that going with as many pages that it is. I mean, I, it's, it's on my read list, but I haven't read a book that, that big since, <laughs> since it. So I'll be honest, uh, well, I'm waiting for the audio book. So. Uh, those are expensive, um, believe it or not. I mean, if you get a really good uh, actor to read it, and uh, that's their job. Those are not cheap. Well, it depends. Uh, I, I, I did that through Audible and used one of their programs where they get a percentage, right? Sure. So they're, they're getting, they get a third of the book. Audible gets a third and, and you get, or Audible gets two thirds and you split the other third with the other producer. But you don't have to, there's no, for me, it was my first book. So I didn't have any money to invest in. Right. So, so I didn't mind losing some of the rights to the book, not okay. the rights, but the, royalties fair enough uh, but you oh, were asking a question how do i how do i do something i'm sorry i missed it how did you keep the oh how did i keep it yeah you know after that's, 30 years of marriage no after how did you keep <laughs> just trying to get to the uh to the end point i mean i had it pretty well structured out i didn't have everything i'm not a true uh plotter i do some pantsing a little bit but i have to at least have some kind of direction uh, that I'm going to go to because I have to end up in a certain uh, place. Can't be totally free form. That's just, you know, the way it worked out for me. Um, but no, it's tough. And everything you write when, when it comes to this genre can, can be checked. And so you really have to do your research and uh, make sure it's correct. All right. Well, let's do a, uh, let's do a quick round. And then, then we'll finish it up because it's okay. been about an hour 40. So if people are still listening. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yep. But, but, but just real quick and, and we'll go through it. We'll go through the numbers. J.A. We'll let, we'll let you go first. So, so give you a second to think about the answer. But if somebody was going to be starting to write for the first time now, what would be your advice to them? What would be, what would be one thing that would help them get started or, or help them, you know, you know, uh, publish, whether they're doing self-publishing, finding an editor, anything that you think would help somebody just getting started. Let's, let's help those people. So to be honest, I know the answer to that before, like halfway into you asking, <laughs> um, but one thing, my battery is going, so I'm going to yeah. have to make it quick. Um, but I think the most important thing starting out and you're writing your first book is pick an amazing story like i mean the actual story so if you're going to just pick a story um a normal romance story or whatever but make that story the plot that idea that you start out with remember like you said you start out with an idea mm -hmm. right make that idea outstanding because if you've got a really good story, it is going to make up for a lot of blunders. Awesome. Right. And I think that's what I did well with my first one. I I over edited it a lot. Like Chris, I was too <laughs> I was too um, analytical about it. I was too nervous. I wanted it to be perfect. I and and I it ended up being a little bit choppy in the first. I would say six chapters. Um, but then after that, the magic of the story took over. Awesome. Right. And I even have some reviews about that, that it was just such an amazing, captivating story that all the commas and the other stuff that weren't right just faded away right so if you have an amazing story that's that's where that's your punch right that's what you got to go for awesome well thank you thank you for being here and, and and we appreciate it again 
And we'll definitely reach out and have you on the next one. So thank you. And feel free yes. to stay. Just I know your battery's <laughs> dying. So if you all of a sudden disappear, you know, we'll, we'll understand and we won't be upset. <laughs> okay. Thank you for having me. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks. All right, okay. Bye-bye. Mr. Chris, what would you do for somebody starting out? Realizing that your first book was, you know, it was all about you and you're telling all about you and things like that. I mean, you know, you're writing a biography on your first book. I mean, come <laughs> on, man. No, just, just kidding. But what what advice would you give a, 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 an author starting out? And you can't use JA, so you have to use your own. So. <laughs> Don't compare yourself to other authors at all. No. You are your own self. You are your own writer. You have your own voice. Uh, you will find that voice. And when you write, it takes a little bit longer than you initially anticipate. But you will find that voice and it will come out loud and clear. <laughs> and when you do find that voice, it, you'll be the happiest person in the world. But until then, you will struggle. You will sort of climb an uphill mountain. And when that voice is written on the page, you will be happier than a pig on feed day. So that is the <laughs> advice that I would give to any aspiring author out there. Do not compare yourself and just be prepared to find your voice because what you think you're going to write is probably not what you're going to write at the end of the day. When I first set out to write my first book about me, uh, when I finished it, it was not the original book that I intended, but it was what it was. So here it is. Exactly. That's awesome. No, that's great advice. All right, Mr. John, how about you, sir? What would what advice would you give? Uh, and it's totally different. I'm actually surprised nobody jumped on this because this is sort of my go to answer. Um, I wrote, I think, a really great first book, and then in the process of trying to discover how to market it, I found the social media community that I'm involved with, yes. uh, which I think has been tremendous. I wish I'd found that when I first started. So to answer your question, if you're an author and you're thinking about writing something or you are in the process of writing something, or maybe you've already written something and you've got a whole bunch of questions or you just don't even know what the next step is, get into some sort of social media community, uh, whether that's Twitter or X, as they call it now, or Blue Sky, or Threads, or Facebook, you know, find some writing community. I guarantee you whatever social media platform you're on, uh, it just keyword search writing community, or author community, or indie author, or something like that, you're going to find uh, a dozen people right off the bat, just like you, that are just starting out. And you're also going to find a whole lot of people that have written several books, and they would be more than happy to explain a lot of uh, pitfalls and traps and things to avoid uh, things that you could find out the hard way. Uh, but maybe you don't want to go down the path that they did. And they're they're more than happy to, to tell you what works and what doesn't work. And uh, that that can save you a whole lot of heartache and and uh, and and wasting time. Um, it, it's never too early or, or, or soon to to find uh, people like yourself and, and case in point, I wouldn't have found this, uh, podcast had it not been for social media, uh, David. So I, th I appreciate that because you can then talk to fellow authors and everybody's at a different stage of their writing career or process. And everyone has lessons learned and everyone is more, I've never met an author ever that wasn't happy to explain what's worked and what hasn't worked and things to do and things not to do. Um, it, it's terrific. Everybody in the community that I'm in is very, very supportive. So that's, that's gold uh, right there. Cause you can't do it by yourself. I mean, you, you can try, you, you'll be a one in a million, uh, Stephen King or an Andy Weir or, or, a, or a, a Hugh Howie. Uh, th those are great success stories, but, but those are very far and few between. There's a lot more people that are struggling that haven't sold a whole lot of books or any books and they want to improve themselves and they want to continue their, their, their journey. And uh, the, the more the merrier, I, I say, uh, more information is always a good thing uh, than, than trying to, to, to beat your head against the wall and figure it out on your own. Hey, if that's what you want to do, that's great. But there's a million people that have been here choose before. And there's a whole lot of things that you can, uh, you can avoid just by uh, knowing uh, versus just not knowing. So get on social media, 
use it for a positive and uh, and 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 meet that community that's going to help you uh, along the way. I love it. I love it. And then for me, it's going to be you know something something that uh, is a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> and and it's uh, you know this is my chance to vent. It's my show now. Uh, uh, don't, <laughs> I have people now that do the recording, so but we'll talk about that later. Now, <laughs> the, uh, the 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 big thing with me is watch out for the different scams and things like that on the the internet when it comes to your writing. Right, mm -hmm. you're going to have people who are going to say, "Oh, I'll promote you to fifty thousand people on Twitter." or X or what have you, or, or I'll give you a review of your book and put it on my blog or what have you. While some of that is good and there are some legitimate things out there, there's a lot of them that I, that I've spent a little bit of money on and, and don't get anything in return. Right. Uh, so, so be careful of the scams, even for the software and things like that. You know, people say, well, Oh, I have to have this piece of software. You know, John uses open office. It is free. Uh, totally I, free. Yeah, I use Microsoft Word because because my kid has to have that for school. So so I pay for that for the family plan, and you get three. So 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 that's what I use. Uh, but you could write. I use with, Notepad. I was just getting ready to say you could write with Notepad, right? You could. That would be the distraction free. So maybe that's going to be my answer going forward. Uh, <laughs> is is to write with Notepad and then copy and paste it in. Uh, I've tried with a lot of the others. Uh, everything has distractions and things like that, but there's also a lot of scams. Uh, and then the last bit of advice, if I'm allowed to, and I think I can because the host isn't going to kick me off, I hope, uh, <laughs> but it's whenever you are getting ready to send your work off to somebody else, make sure you get the copyright or whatever it's called for, for, for the country of origin where you live so that, that you don't lose the rights to your book somehow. It doesn't cost that much to, to go to the, the copyright.gov or whatever the website is, do the research or email it me and I'll send it to you. And you can get the copyright for your book so that you have no questions about it. I have talked to authors who got kicked off of Amazon temporarily until they were able to prove that the book was theirs and not someone else. So there are people doing stuff like that to get the copyright. So so yes, that's that's something that's later on. So don't fall for scams and, and get the copyright. So with that said, unless Chris or John, you have anything else that we would like to no. give advice to people, I appreciate you all sticking in with me here and, <laughs> and we will have this thing again. And let's and do it. Yep. Thanks everyone for listening. Appreciate it. I'm just going to sort of do a special plug though. Please. Uh, it's Christmas time, everyone. Yes. Uh, go support independent authors. Perfect. Go take a moment and go buy a book from an independent author. Yeah, uh, it's always great to support the big guys, but sometimes supporting an independent author goes more than you can imagine. So Absolutely. you saw some great some books here today. Go out and purchase one of them because Perfect. it will help people and it gets our word out. So. That's my little plug for this Christmas time. It's Excellent. a perfect thing. You know, you support your support your independent authors. <laughs> talk to your local bookstores to see if they can carry copies of, of those books as well. So perfect. So appreciate everybody being here. Thanks.